everyone, and welcome to Eastside Online. We are so excited to have you joining us this weekend. If this is your first time watching, check out the comment section right now. There is a link posted for a Connect card. Fill that Connect card out, get to know you a little bit, and somebody from our team will reach out to you just to say hello. If you haven't already, make sure that you like this page or channel, however it is that you're viewing it, and make sure that you share it. We would love for all the people that are on your feed to be able to see our services and be exposed to the message of Jesus. This is the fourth week of our series Made for This, and we're so excited to be welcoming back our lead pastor, Dave Hastings. So make sure that you have your communion elements ready for later on in the service. And right now, we're gonna go ahead and get into a time of worship.
who believes he can turn our graves into gardens. Amen. And I search the world. Well, it couldn't feel me. There's empty praise, treasures that fade. Never enough. Then you came along. Put me back together and Every desire Is now satisfied Here in your love Sing it out, there's nothing And there's nothing It's better than you, Lord There's nothing Better than you, Lord There's nothing Sing it out, I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, failures and flaws, Lord, you see them all, you still call me friend, because the God of the mountain is still the God.
Hebrews chapter 12 tells us this, that Jesus Christ endured the cross. And it says that he did so because of the joy that he knew was going to come from that. So here you have this man who is 100% innocent of any crime whatsoever. There's no doubt that he's innocent. And yet, even though he is, he is led to the cross to take a punishment that is meant for the worst of criminals. And in chapter 12, verse two, it tells us that we need to fix our eyes on Jesus because he is the author and the finisher of our faith. And just as this song that we're about to sing reminds us of that, we need to continually make sure that we're focusing our eyes on him because he endured the cross knowing the pain and the torture that he was going to have. He knew it was for a greater purpose. It was for us to have eternal life, to have relationship with him. And so right now, as we take the bread and as we take the juice, I encourage you to fix your eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. God, I thank you right now for being the God that you are, for sending your son to take such a, a terrible, terrible punishment for someone like me. God, because I know for a fact that he didn't deserve that punishment and the fact that he took it simply to have relationship with us, simply to give us that opening to have eternal life through him, it, it just means the world. And so I pray that each and every day that we take time, that we remember this sacrifice, that we fix our eyes upon Jesus because of who he is and because of the sacrifice that he paid for us. God, we love you and thank you and remember this in Jesus' name, amen. This ghost is a fire Holy flame burning wild Burning through the night Burning through the light Of a billion scars Love is like light Crashing through the sky Burning through the range It needs to be erased A billion scars Get ready
sing this song, it, it comes alive in a, in a different way. Tonight we just want to declare that our King is among us. Amen. Oh, the Father saw in the days of old.
Team Taco. Team Burgers. Definitely Team Hamburger. Uh, team Hamburger. Tacos. Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, probably Team Tacos, because that's the last thing we made at the house. Tacos. Oh, that's a hard one. It's a hard one. Um, taco. Tacos. Would you rather live without the internet or live without AC and heating? The internet. Oh, live without AC and heating. Internet. Uh, without the internet, by far. Definitely the internet. Without internet. Internet. Oh. Internet. Yeah, without internet. What does it mean to conform your life to Christ? Um, I would think it would be um, basically trying to live your best life in the eyes of him, the way he would want you to be. Read the Bible and pray to him and not and be consistent and not just do it one day a week, do it all the time. Conforming your life to Christ means that you are giving up on everything that you held on to and you are trying to mirror and mimic and take on um, how Christ lived his life. And so your life looks completely different than what it was when you were living for yourself. It means to um, constantly be um, learning from him and trying to um, be more like him in everything that we do every single day. Yeah. Keep your focus on him and that you're walking, um, learning from him and his word and just experiences you go through. You are um, remembering those and try not to make the same mistakes, but you you follow his footsteps. To try to emulate his goodness, his thoughtfulness, the fact that nobody is not good enough. I want to get to that point in my life where I have only good thoughts. I think it's to love the things that Jesus loves. I think it's to be bothered by the things that bother Jesus. And I think those are two of the biggest things. Just give everything you got and just surround yourself with the right people. Live in power of him, like love him and everything you do is for him. Isn't that good to see a couple young men at the end of that say that kind of stuff, huh? That's really good. You can clap for that, okay? That's good to see. That is good to see. Well, this is, uh, this is week four of a five-week teaching series that we've been going through called Made for This. And before I jump into uh, what I want to talk about with the fourth week, I, I think it's just a good time to kind of hit the pause button for a second. And, and let me explain something called a thread of understanding. And I, I think that's really important for us to kind of grapple with uh, before we jump into this fourth week. When we build teaching series here at Eastside, and we plan those out, we have a, a single truth, one rifle point that we want to be threaded through every message in that series. And so we call it our thread of understanding, or we call it our, our single truth. And then every message in that series will continually come back to that one thread of understanding, that one driving truth that we want to bring home. And so we've got five weeks where we're talking about this idea of being made for this, and the thread of understanding for every week, including tonight, the, the single truth that we want to bring up from the surface of everything we talk about every week is that your life, your life has a better chance of reaching an optimum satisfaction. I mean, who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want my life to be the best my life can possibly be? Everybody wants that. And so you've got a greater chance of attaining that in your life if you can figure out how to align yourself to the purpose of why God put you here. And so that's the thread of understanding that we're going through for five weeks. And if you think about it in those terms, the closer that you can get to the very reason why God made you, then, then life is just escalated in satisfaction and fulfillment. But if you just ignore that, 
if you don't give any concern or thought at all to why God put you on this earth, then it just seems like something is missing in life. And so we've kind of put together this, this idea for about a month here where we're going to the Word of God and we're finding places in the Word of God where he describes, this is why I made you. You are made for this. And the more that we connect to that and engage in that, man, life just gets better. Jesus one time said, I've come that you may have life. And if you know the verse, he said, and have it to the full. He didn't want you just to live. He wanted you to live to the full. And so you can have life or you can have life to the full. And the difference of those two is figuring out why God put you on this earth. Now, I thought last week was a great example of that. Winston talked about being made for service, that God put us on this earth so that we understood one of the purposes of our life is that we're serving God, we're serving people. And the more that that becomes part of your DNA, the more you figure it out that when you wake up in the morning, man, it is about doing something to advance the kingdom of God, to be a blessing to other people, that when you get that straight in your life, man, just life, it just gets better. But if you go throughout life thinking that this world is about you, man, you're just always miserable. If you don't believe that, hang out with a three-year-old for a few days and you find out how miserable they are because they think it's all about them. And so with that kind of idea that I wanted to kind of preface what I want to talk about today, we jump into this fourth week and we bring another reason why God placed you on this earth, why you're here. And it is that you are made for conformity. And what we mean by that is, that is that God puts you here so that your life can be molded and, and formed and created and, and put into this, this, this life that reflects the character of God. And the reason for that is because God wants people to know who he is, listen to this, through you. That if you want to know who God is, then he says, look at my creations. And so we're here to make ourselves conform to what God looks like. Now, if any of you are as old as me, uh, you've been around for a while, you might recognize uh, the name George Schultz. And uh, Mr. Schultz was the Secretary of State under President Reagan. And one of the things that he was responsible for was overseeing our ambassadors all over the world. And Mr. Schultz had a little thing that he did in his office with all people who were considered to be an ambassador. So they would interview them and things like that. In Schultz's office, he had a, he had a giant globe. And he would have a person come in who was being considered as one of our ambassadors somewhere in the world. And he would send them over to the globe and he would say, find your country. And so if you were being considered as a United States ambassador to the nation of Zambia, and you couldn't find Zambia on the globe, you probably weren't going to get the job. And so that became known as Schultz's thing. You go into office, man, you got to be able to find your country. A guy by the name of Mike Mansfield, a former senator, was the United States uh, ambassador to Japan for many, many years. And one day, uh, Mansfield was back in the, in the Capitol, and he went into uh, Schultz's office, and they were kind of joking around a little bit, and Schultz said, hey, go find your country. And so as the ambassador to Japan, he goes over, and he spins the, country, the globe, and he puts his finger, and he stops it on the United States. And he looked at Mr. Schultz, and he said, that's my country. And I never forget that when I'm in Japan. See, that's conformity to God. To understand above everything else that our life is to represent him. 
That everything that happens from our life has the purpose to represent him. Our attitudes, our speech, the things we do, the words we say, everything has the purpose to conform to God so that people learn who God is through us. Now, if you can just take yourself for a second and kind of wrap your mind around that, that is an amazing thought that God put you together to say, I want you to go represent me. That's what God did when he made you. And so our lives have this ultimate purpose to conform to the likeness of God. And it gets back to the thread of understanding. The closer we can get to that, man, life just better. And if that is ignored and you don't ever think about it and it's of no concern to you, then it just seems like life is always missing a cylinder somewhere. Now, this was obviously very important to God because all through his word, he talks about this. I want to give you just some scriptures. I'm going to raffle through them real quick here. Just kind of, kind of whet your appetite and kind of set the stage for something I want to show you in a few minutes. But just kind of look at some scriptures that kind of present that thought. Um, somewhere along the way, most of us have read this from the creation account. From Genesis 1, verse 26. Let us make man in our own image, in our own likeness. And so at the very creation of the world, when God is putting together men and women, he said, let's make them like my image and, and my likeness. I, I studied those words a little bit, and I'm, I'm not a great student of, of Hebrew words, but the best that I could get in my, my limited studies of those is one of those words kind of reflects who you are internally, and the other word is kind of what you actually do physically. And so when God shaped you and put you together and placed you on this earth, his idea was everything you are internally and everything you do externally, let it look like me. That's why you're here, man. That's why you're here. Check out this verse that is a, a big verse for us here at Eastside. Romans 8, 29. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. It's a very important verse because it actually is going back to the creation account where God put us together in his image, in his likeness, and you and I both know that sin came and it just ruined that because we don't very many times look like God. We don't very many times act like God. And so Romans comes along years later and it says, recover that, recover it. Get your form and your shape back to the conformity of Jesus. Look like Jesus, talk like Jesus, think like Jesus. Everything about you be like Jesus. I love the way the message version of the Bible translates Ephesians 4. Look at this. Everything, and I do mean everything, connected with that old way of life has to go. It's rotten through and through. Get rid of it. And then take on an earthly new way of life. A God-fashioned life, a life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct, as, watch this, as God accurately reproduces his character in you. Catch that ending, that he reproduces his character in you. And so there's verses throughout all the Bible that just kind of bring that point up over and over, that we are placed here to reflect, to be the mirror image of God so that people can learn who he is through us and through watching us. All through the Bible, that's hinted at over and over and over and over. Now, I've, I've used those verses, just kind of set the stage a little bit to a particular passage that I want to talk about that is a little bit more pointed. Those first three that I looked at are kind of cheerleader verses. You know, we can do it, we can do it, we can do it. What I'm about to read is more of a drill sergeant passage because it begins to explain how you do it. I'm going to show it to you on the screen. 
And uh, I want to make a few comments about it, and then we're going to make some applications uh, today. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Let me read these. I'm going to make some points about them. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him. Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thanksgiving, with thankfulness. Now, let me share some thoughts about that that are a bit pointed. And I want you to kind of stay with me and follow these. I want you to notice that receiving Jesus and living for Jesus are the same thing. Receiving Jesus is when we understand that he's offering us forgiveness through what he did on the cross. And we receive that forgiveness. We look forward to heaven. We become Christians. But watch this very carefully. If you have genuinely received him, then you live it. You live like you've received him. And if you live a life that has no change in it, that if you receive Jesus today and now you look back and say, man, I have never changed anything in my life, then you've never really received him. And I don't know how to say this any clearer, gang, is that when someone really accepts Jesus, when they really become a Christian, they then change things in their life to reflect him more. No change, no real reception. There is always change. Notice also that if Jesus is really received, you are rooted. He said you are rooted in Jesus. Now I'm going to get nasty for a second. Is it okay? Can I be nasty? Just for a minute. Okay. All right. Y'all want me to be nasty to your neighbor. So here we go. I want you to listen to this carefully. Rooted means this. That you're not hot with God today and cold with him tomorrow. You're not following his word this month and ignoring his word next month. You're not regularly gathering to worship God in church with his family this season, but then you take a season off that discipline at another time in the year. That's not being rooted. If you're always up and down and in and out with your faith, then the problem is you've not received Jesus yet. And I want to make sure that you hear that, that God put us together so that we would reflect who he is, that we would conform to the likeness of his father, and we, we would learn to do that. And, and the idea is that if, I, that if I'm, I'm in and out and up and down and on and off, then you're not rooted because when you receive Jesus, you're always rooted. Notice this, when you receive Jesus, you're always building up, you're always getting stronger. Three months from day, you'll look back and you'll say, man, I'm a stronger believer than I was three months ago. And then three months down the line, I am stronger than I was then. I'm always getting stronger. The Christian life never has you getting weaker. Never. Rick Warren wrote this. And if you don't like it, it hurts you. Write him a letter. See what it'll do for you. Check this out. Your heavenly father's goal for you is to mature and develop the characteristics of Jesus Christ. And sadly, millions of Christians grow older, but they never grow up. And they are stuck in perpetual spiritual infancy, remaining in diapers and booties. Somebody say, bam! Okay? When you receive Jesus... You are growing. You're always growing and getting stronger. Now watch this. Be careful to make sure you catch this. I don't know if you noticed when we read that scripture a minute ago, he ended this by saying, and be overflowing with thankfulness. So if you receive Jesus, really, you understand what you were made while you're here, and you've received Jesus. I need to reflect the Father, and you reflect the Son. Watch this. You live a life of thanksgiving, not a life of grumbling. Now, I'm just going to read this because I wrote it, and after I wrote it, I said, doggone, that is good. So let me read this for you. 
And I say this to myself as much as I say it to anybody, okay? And here's what I wrote. I know it's been a tough year, but it's time we get rid of our negativity. It's time we quit complaining about some of the things we can't do right now. It's time we quit blaming the political party that we didn't vote for. It's time we quit arguing over numbers and masks and handshakes. It's time we stop choosing sides over every issue that can possibly be debated. And instead of all that, how about we wake up in the morning being thankful that we're still alive? That we still have a few family and friends willing to hang out with us. That we've got a place to sleep and some food to eat. And we live in a country that has luxuries much of the world doesn't even know about. We probably have a few bucks laying around we can spend at our own discretion. Most of us have jobs. Those who don't are probably going to be able to find one before long. And more important than all of it, we've got a God who loves us in spite of how we act, is willing to forgive us upon a simple request, and is busy getting ready our place place in heaven so that he can welcome us with open arms when that day comes. Gratitude always takes over grumbling for the Christian. Amen. Always. Amen. Always. And see, gang, I'm as frustrated as you when I watch the news and I watch these idiots fighting and arguing on TV. I get frustrated with that. What I get really frustrated about it is when we do it. Because we were not made for that. When you receive Jesus and your purpose is to reflect the Father, you live with an air of gratitude. Okay, so let's don't belabor the point anymore. I think we've all got it. God has made us to reflect his image. And the, the closer we get to that, the more life is just, you know, explodes in fulfillment. But the, the question is, how do you do that? How do you actually make that happen? And so I want to give you a couple of applications, and you can take those as you leave here, and just two really clear things that will help you reflect, mirror the image of God. Here's the very first one. Figure out your weak points where God ends up getting put up on the shelf. And all of us do that. All of us have that happen from time to time. I'm going to give you a story of, of how that happened in, in a setting that I had recently that I think will help you put some, put some teeth to it. Um, the, the elders here at Eastside, incredibly gracious and generous and allow me every year a little bit of getaway time with our family uh, to kind of rejuvenate a little bit. And so a few days ago, I am, I am in a pool at a resort. And I know that's probably messing with some of you if you're thinking about that, but, but just kind of get over it. I'm in a pool. I'm in a pool with my wife and uh, my son, Kyle. And my grandson, five-year-old Ace, and so we're, we're in this pool at this resort. And um, a lady comes out at the other end of the pool and announces they're going to play this contest game. And my little five-year-old grandson, I mean, he just takes off and swims to that end of the pool, gets up on the deck, and he's going to be part of the game. And so people start coming in and uh, being part of the game. They probably get about 30 people or so there. And they, they've got them lined out in a couple lines. And um, it's kind of the old water balloon game. So, so I'm here and you're across me, your partner. And we're going we're gonna to throw the balloon and catch it. And if you catch it and you don't break, you're going you're gonna to go back one. So that game is happening. And so all these people are coming. And the director's giving instructions to everybody, come on up. And, and little Ace is there. He was the first guy up there, and, uh, and he's got a balloon, and they've teamed him up with this cute little girl, probably six or seven. And so we're all of the way at the other end of the pool, and we're kind of watching this, and, and right before he gets started, this other little girl comes in, and she kind of eases her way into the line there, and the, the activity director teams her up with our grandson's uh, partner. So you got the two girls there, and the director kind of leaned down and whispered uh, something to Ace, and, and Ace just kind of 
walks out, and he's obviously out of the game, and he's kind of walking back with kind of a downcast pout on his face. And so we're watching it from the pool back here, and, uh, and my sweet, and gentle, calm, mild-natured wife is watching the whole thing, and, and somebody's doing something to her grandson that she didn't like, and, and she looked at it, and she says, what, what, what's going on? And, and I said, I, I, think he got, I think he got kicked out of the game. And she looked at me and Kyle, and she said, I, I don't think so. And she starts hoofing it down, walking through this whole pool. I mean, there was a time where I thought pretty sure she, I thought I saw her walking on top of the water. I mean, she was heading back there. And I looked at my son and he said, "Uh uh-oh. And she got down there and she lit into this, this director. And she said, what what are you doing? And they said, he didn't have a partner. And she goes, he had a partner, that little girl. And he said, well, that little girl coming to your sister. And so so we're having a partner. We had a, and she said, you don't kick a five-year-old out of a game, particularly since he was the first person there. She goes, he don't have a partner. And she said, he does now. And she jumped up there, and she's playing the game now. And we're watching it at the other end of the pool going, oh, man, what is happening? And so the director says, okay, let's play the game. And says, one, two, three, throw your balloons. Well, little Ace didn't understand the nature of the game. And so he rockets it at his nana, and it splatters all over. And the director says, you're out of the game. And she says, give him another one. That was just a practice. She said, yes, ma'am. What was happening there? What was happening there? She lost her mind for a minute. Because as a nana, you don't mess with her grandchildren. You don't do anything bad with her grandchildren. You don't do that. And nobody was going to try to stop her. I mean, your husband ain't going to stop her. You don't care what he says. Don't care what her son says. Don't care what an activity director says. Don't care what the president of the United States says. Don't care what God, Jesus, or the Spirit says. She's going to rescue, rescue her, her grandson. And everybody here has that. Everybody here has that, that part of your life that is, that is kind of, you know, at that moment, you just really don't care what God thinks you're going to do, what you're passionate about. And we all have it. And if I want to conform my life to the likeness of the Father, and I want to mirror him and reflect his goodness and his grace, I'm going to identify what are those kind of ugly parts where I put God on the shelf, and I'm going to fix it. And so I want to challenge you to do that. I'm going to challenge you to think through what are the kind of the bad, bad things when God puts up on the shelf because we're going to do our own thing. Fix those. And on the other flip side of that, is not only do we figure out the weak points where God gets on the shelf, but we, we figure out the strong points where God wants us to shine. And see, everybody in this room has those strong points. It's a fascinating concept to me about this. The Bible says Christians are given spiritual gifts. They're kind of like leanings. They're, they are propensities. They are, they are tendencies of things that you want to do, you enjoy doing, you do them well. And the Bible says when you're a Christian, you get those tendencies, those gifts in order to help people, in order to advance God and serve his purposes, and and you receive those as a Christian. And if you want to mirror the nature of God in your life, you're going to figure out, what is that in my life? What has God called me to be and do? What do I do good at? What do I smile about? Last week before Winston preached, there was a video bumper of some people in our church who were asked the question how they would define service and being a servant, the topic that Winston preached about. And there's a, a lady in our church by the name of Denise Stenbro, and she's, she's an incredible volunteer in our church, and she said this, I define it as happy sacrifice. Man, I about fell off my chair when I was hearing it. I said, that is exactly right. That we all have those things in our life that God has called us to be about and do, and we're passionate about them, and they help people, and they advance the kingdom of God, and be about those things. Be about those things. 
And if I can figure out the weak parts of my life where God has put on the shelf, and I fix that, and I deal with that, and then I major, I bloom in the areas where God has called me to be about his business, watch what happens is I begin to reflect him. I mirror his image, and my life begins to explode with purpose. So when you leave, I call you to do that. Whether you're here in this building, you're watching online, that you begin that this week. My weak parts, God put on the shelf. No more, man, no more. My good things, the great points of my life where God has called me to be about things. I'm good at those things. I'm going to bloom. I'm going to plant those. I'm going to do those well. And life will be what God called life to be. I remember an old story that revival preachers used to use decades ago to increase the inspiration of their audience. They used to tell a story about an old businessman in, in downtown Chicago that got off work one afternoon. He came down the high rise and he went out on Michigan Avenue. It was in the dead of winter around Christmas time. There's snow, the wind from Lake Michigan is just bitter cold. And he gets out and he sees this, this, little, this little guy, this little, little kid on the street. And he's just crying. And the businessman said, man, what's going on? And, and, and he looked at the guy and he said, I, I had a dollar, and I've lost my dollar. When I get home, my dad's really going to be mad at me. And the businessman said, well, for Pete's sake, and grabbed some money, gave the boy a dollar, and patted him on the back, and went on his way. He'd gotten down a, a few yards on the street, and the guy felt a tug on his coat, and he turned around, that little boy was there, and, and he looked down at him, and he said, uh, he said, what is it, son? And, the, and that little guy looked at him and he said, uh, he said, mister, are you God? And that's what it means to conform. Not that you're God, but that you resemble him. You were made for that. Father, I thank you that you've asked somebody like me to represent you. I thank you that those in this room who know Jesus have been called to do the same thing, and that's a, that's a task we're not always real good at. But I pray for your help. I pray this is not a message we forget, but we're gonna remember it tomorrow morning and the next day and the next day. And we're going to fulfill the purpose of which you made us by reflecting the beautiful image of you and your son. May you go with us. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. I mean, what an incredible message that was from Dave. We're so excited that he was able to join us and, and return to the stage this weekend. And here's the thing, you're sitting at home, maybe throughout the service, throughout the worship or the message, maybe you've had some questions, or maybe you say, I wanna make a decision to allow Jesus into my life for the first time. Well, check out that comment section right now. The link is there for the connect card. Fill that out, mark on there that you want to talk to somebody about a decision, and somebody from our team will reach out to you and start that conversation with you. Remember, if you haven't already, you can jump on the app or the website and give for this week if you haven't. And just as Dave was talking about, our purpose is to conform our life to the life of Jesus. We are, we are to emulate who Jesus was. So what's that stuff in your life that you have to get rid of? What's the stuff that you have to say, if I'm going to follow Jesus, this stuff has to go because that's not what he would do. So I challenge you to consider that this week and join us next week as we close out our series Made for This. Have a terrific week.